it's usually a yo-yo between these two right like either you grow or you are profitable sometimes you throw so much money to grow you're just throwing money to acquire users that you lose your unit unit economics so what are you opt- optimizing for in this marketplace is it like more like revenue or is it the price or is it more the you know the payout for the gig worker I'm like saying the multiple users here retailers the users and uh, are the people who deliver right so you are trying to optimize for everyone the one thing that i tell my pms is the only product that is useful ultimately is something that makes an impact ultimately on the end customer of the product hey everyone uh, welcome to our podcast everything product in this podcast we talk about product management concepts and latest technology insights uh, today we have a very uh, special treat for all the viewers out there uh, we are glad pleased and honored to uh, invite uh, mr vishal kapoor uh, the senior director of product management uh, hey vishal thank you very much for taking your time uh it's great to be here i'm looking forward to the conversation yeah just for all the viewers out there uh vishal is been a visionary leader who has uh, shaped the product landscape across various companies uh, such as uh, lift and zynga and also has been an advisor for various startups uh, in supporting them so uh, which is amazing so uh maybe uh vishal uh will uh, let you introduce uh, yourself uh, so everyone uh, learns a little bit more about you Sure. Uh, thank you guys for having me here. Uh, this is very exciting. I have seen your podcast. I've seen some of the past episodes. You guys have had some very esteemed guests recently, and even in the past. And uh, I have learned a lot by listening to some of their insights and some of the things that they have shared. So uh, it's it's really a privilege to be in that company. It's really a privilege to be able to talk to you guys. So thank you for having me. Uh, just by ways of introduction i think srinath you kind of covered the basics the way i like to dis- describe this is i'm a recovering product manager or re- or a recovering engineer uh, i used to be an engineer in my past life and uh, now i am a pm uh, you know so i started my career uh, with a masters in computer science i got i got trained in technology i got some technical training first uh and then i started working as an engineer like a lot of us right a lot of us get into product from a lot of different ways uh we come through a lot of us come through technology a lot of us i know now that i work with i have teams and you know uh, different people that i work with uh, a lot of us also just come from business training so we have a business background right not necessarily there's there's bachelors in business for example bachelors in economics i've also seen people with training from marketing and a lot of other disciplines so product management is a very very varied discipline very varied role in which you can come to products to product management through a lot of different avenues right uh, i think it's getting more and more mature now because a lot of companies have done this for a long time but when i was starting yes it was it was mature i'm i'm not going to say it was immature you know about 10 years ago 10 12 years ago when i started it wasn't that immature but it was still somewhat new relatively new and you know a lot of lot of the things that we take for granted today were actually relatively new about 10 years ago facebook was just for context facebook was a private company when i became a pm right so it's a long time ago uh, you know uh, so anyway i started then uh, started as an engineer i got my feet wet at one of the biggest marketplaces amazon.com that's where i started as an engineer uh, it still survives still exists it's still thriving uh, that company uh, started there started writing uh some sort of machine learning code actually uh, again machine learning was also not what it is right now you know the way you hear about machine learning and all that it was not that it was like writing boring programs doing some boring things you know querying databases you know doing something this and that in fact i worked at amazon uh i worked on advertising systems uh which was also this was also actually uh, adwords was already there google adwords was there and and people knew that uh ads was going to be sort of the big one of the big revenue generators for technology you know going forward again as i said facebook was private so keep that in context right like facebook ads it was not what facebook is today it was a private company it was there but it wasn't in in this uh, in this much diversity and variety now facebook ads are instagram ads whatsapp ads right like all these ads that facebook has besides facebook itself uh, none of that was it wasn't that mature ads themselves weren't that mature but it was there so i worked on that internally at amazon from there then i uh, worked for search engines i actually worked for bing 
which is again in the news now because of chat gpt as the audience will know so i started that i started working on that i was an engineer for bing wrote some search engine code and and, and things like that this is a lot of fun back then, then i joined zynga uh and zynga was a gaming company uh zynga is a gaming company uh and i think one of the most notorious games that it is notorious for is farmville uh you mm. know a lot of audience is probably in india especially especially in india also in the us i know that we used to monitor daily active users and most of the audience a lot of the audience was actually people from uh from this side from you know from the east side from india from these countries uh, people used to love playing sim games like farmville for example sim- simulation games like farmville right uh so did that from there they have another game which I, which was very personal to me uh and i think that is a little bit of a philosophy of how i like to build product and what i like to do so the game that i chose to uh, start my pm career or the the product that i chose to start my pm career was actually they have a game called words with friends and words with friends is essentially scrabble so you are playing scrabble with other people on a mobile phone so like let's say Trina if you and i for example had uh, both of us were playing words with friends you would have an app words with friends app downloaded on your phone i would have it and then it's just turn based scrabble which we are playing over over the internet right so it's just like that so then uh, i started there i am i am not i i keep telling myself and we can talk about this later but i keep telling myself that i am not a gamer so words with friends was probably the best game i am a reader my my wife is reading it's not gaming so i like reading every day uh so for me uh words with friends was probably the best game that i could actually connect with i had empathy for the product you know as as best as i could uh, as best as i could relate to the product that i was contributing right for example now if you ask me what kind of products or if for the audience right one of the questions is how would you jump into pm what 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 would you do i would say the first thing that you should optimize for is whether it feels like work or whether it feels like like a natural extension of what you want to do so if it feels like something that you want to do uh it it's your natural drive the problem is very meaningful to you for whatever reason it's meaningful to you personally then i think it becomes a lot easier to think creatively to have the drive to contribute to that area to push the boundary etc if it feels like work where you're going and working with a team of people fine you may do great work but that, at the end of the day like is is the problem are you intrinsically motivated by the problem you want to make a difference or are you just doing it because you have a paycheck you have a job you you have good people that you're working it's a big i was at zynga for 7 years so it was a while i learned a lot i think the one thing that i learned in games is that games have no rules right it's just like whatever you can think of you can make a character virtual you can do whatever you want like you know essentially virtual currency co- connections messaging this that whatever you want it's like telling a story essentially right so it's very creative uh the good thing is you can you you understand the uh the the art of developing product by churning through a lot of ideas how do you do that fast and the other problem is games it's 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 a advantage and disadvantage when i was there i felt it was a little bit of a disadvantage but now that i'm not doing that i feel it is such a power like such a powerful thing so one thing was that games are like movies you know people get bored you can play a game for so long but after some time you need something new right you can watch a movie for only so long and then you're looking it's called hits it's a hits based business so you know i uh one of the things that happens that happens in any gaming company is as soon as you release a new version you are, you know that people will get bored in the next 3 to 6 months so you're on a treadmill constantly trying to figure out what next what next yeah. so in the moment it felt like this is like it never ends because no matter what you do it's not never going to be good enough right like yeah. is there product market fit yeah it's there right now but in a month month and a half you might see people getting bored you know they might start getting out of the product what do you do like so it's always like very fast paced and anything is possible so i think a combination of those two the the discipline with which gaming companies work at least that that i've seen the with discipline with which zynga worked was insane the analytics that we had the way we ran product the way we thought about connecting different parts of the business through technology acquisition retention you know churn monetization you know prediction this that everything was just it was just very very it was it was extremely mature for a company at that time so that's why i say that when when i joined it it may seem like product management wasn't that mature but i happened to be in a situation where i learned a lot and i felt like the situation demanded maturity of uh, you know of some of these things that we take for granted otherwise so all that happened 
and then i think i came to lift and then at lift i was like this is my calling i love marketplaces uh, you know i've i've spoken about marketplaces a lot uh, i think the foundational you know technology meets the real world it doesn't it, it never got more real for me than that like i as i said i had worked for search engines i'd worked for advertising algorithms i'd worked for all these other i'd worked for a game but i'm not a gamer right so i had done okay. all of these things before but then then i came to lift where you know i literally every day i would basically pull out the app i would click a button a car would come i would actually take that to work uh, you know and i was like this solves a problem for me i live in a, i live in the city i live in san francisco at the time i did not have a car uh because i was like i was living in the in the middle of the city it's a dense area parking was challenging etc and i was like this is exactly the case that ride share was built for and uber's uber's headquarters old headquarters the original headquarters was actually right across the street from me so i lived okay. right there you know so uh so the idea was that uh uh this is this is a company this is a thing that is ind- indispensable in my life i cannot live without this ultimately so then you know i found that connection i found the empathy i also found a lot of motivation in the fact that through the work that i am doing right now or my teams are doing we are actually able to make a difference in the lives of somebody so for example you know when i came to the us i was a student and graduate student and i had a job and all of that right to fund myself uh, and now through this the way i found my own passion was i would tell myself and we would also hear this in feedback some of the time maybe there is a graduate student out there who's using lift to fund themselves yeah, right so mm. kind of came full circle for me i think yeah. i really love that that creation of that economic opportunity for people and then eventually from there you know shift was actually shift is a slightly harder problem i know we are going to talk about that in a second but shift is a three sided marketplace lift is two and three becomes harder uh, so uh, so then you know i came to this more complex problem space and you know it's delivery and logistics and and you know i've not looked back i've been at shift for 3 years i have a team of people pms that reported to me at this point i uh, lead uh, what i call as the algorithmic systems of the company so algorithmic systems meaning all the engines that power fulfillment the actual so you place an order but how does that order go from from you placing an order all the way to your doorstep and if you're not satisfied then what are some of the steps you can returns and things like that right uh, you know refunds and returns and things like that how can you actually make that happen is something that uh, you know that those are the type of problems that i actually work on my teams work on so it's been extremely gratifying it's been extremely satisfying working working in this space and that's sort of my journey you know 20 year 20 plus year career journey in like a few minutes <laughs> no i awesome, love that awesome. uh, i love the way you started it vishal honestly uh, every product every product manager is different and that's the that's the beauty of the role i think right you could have an engineering background you could have a marketing background you could have any other background too but still you can come add value and then build products that can solve customer problem yeah love absolutely that. absolutely yeah especially the farm will i know stuck with me right like when i was when we were in undergrad right it was like a phenomena like i remember <laughs> my roommate asking me to go log into his account to harvest stuff because it will go away after a while <laughs> yeah, yeah i know i know it was it was the the company was built on very sound principles uh, it was addictive you know games games a lot of products today you know facebook instagram any you know your dating apps for example right the idea is that they exist because they can sustain a network of people mm. if you cannot sustain a network if you cannot sustain a network of players for a game because it's not interesting or addictive enough there will be no game because you mm. you need that network in order to keep the game going and so you know the addictiveness it's i, I and i mean that in a positive way right i, I don't mean addiction as a you know addiction as mm. a as a negative word but you need that in order to sustain in order to cre- you need the scale in order to maintain scale in this example right so facebook needs imagine you know if if facebook's users lot of users left facebook facebook would be very uninteresting the whole point is it's user generated content and the network actually you know makes that happen so yeah so it's, sure. it's it's like that there's network effects obviously there's network effects people have talked about it a lot uh, but I, we experienced that first time when we started you know i experienced that when i started working on some of these things yep so yeah. i might have asked asked you to water my farm as well at that time <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's one of the popular games that i remember as well yeah that's amazing uh, jani vishal i'm sure a lot of people resonate i mean as you said 
lot of people including us we started from an engineering background now we are all product managers and we can right. closely relate to some of the things that you mentioned and the transition it's tough not impossible so you just need to create that path and how to and i think some of the things that you brought up the empathy what you want to do and all that stuff and a lot of this problem solving capability which is a pretty important so right. yeah and i know you kind of touched a bit on the shift uh, your role in the team um maybe for all the viewers out there uh, um, there's a concept of three way marketplace right which is quite different from a two way marketplace like a lift or a uber and right. uh, can you maybe help clarify what that means and how that is different from other traditional yeah. marketplaces yeah i'll give you i'll try and give you and the viewers as concrete an example as possible hopefully this is not i know it's this is not too technical but hopefully you know they will be able to understand why this is notoriously hard okay yep. so imagine you <clears throat> place a grocery order imagine you are using us ship you're using instacart you're using doordash you know uber eats whatever right take your pick i mean uber eats they also do some groceries now they've started doing groceries as well you use walmart you use whatever now a lot of grocery orders that people like us put into the system uh you would have a lot of the times you would actually have some sort of perishable item like milk eggs ice cream right i mean a lot of the orders that we see i won't go into numbers uh, obviously we look at all this data but a lot of the orders that we actually see uh, have these these type of perishable items in them. fine right obvious so far uh now the thing is that when you place an order us as consumers when we place an order we would like to be available to take the order so that we can put those things away into the fridge because if we don't then the order goes bad those perishable items go bad also very obvious so now what happens is as a result of this very very fundamental uh nature of of how grocery delivery works specifically grocery delivery other deliveries are slightly different and and we are actually able to take a lot of advantage in other spaces versus groceries but i'll explain why i'm trying to explain what in my mind is one of the most complex problems right so grocery delivery for example it seems like that so because of that what happens is that when we as consumers place an order we want the order to be delivered at a certain point in time when we are available to actually pick up the order so to simplify that mm. segment if you are working in the day and you are out to office now people are returning to office for example if you are working you might want to place the order for delivery when the delivery happens once you reach back let's say 6 pm 7 pm some point at that time so simple enough right you are placing the order in the day in the morning when you come back home you want the deliveries you you may want the deliveries uh either to 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 physically collect the delivery or you may want them to leave the delivery at that time within that time you know that if the delivery happens 2 hours later by the time you reach there your milk is going to go bad like things like that mm-hmm. so you have to manage this tight window for everything that you're doing right through through technology mm-hmm. essentially so that's also fine right now the challenge is coming back to what i said when you are placing an order you are potentially placing it while you are at work in the morning the delivery is actually happening let's say let's take an example right you're placing an order at noon it's your lunch break you're placing an order around 12 because you have a few minutes you want the delivery to happen let's say you reach home by 6 let's say you want for for being on the safe side you want so you don't want the goods to go bad you want the delivery to happen between 7 and 8 and then between 7 and 8 or or let's say you want it to happen between 6 and 7 and and you know that when the delivery comes at that time you may use some of the groceries to cook dinner that time mm-hmm. also very strict this all of this is is exactly how the world works and all of this is how we see the use cases and things like that so i'm just giving you you know one of the examples right so this is sort of how it works so let's say that happens so now that here's the challenge for a company like us so for ride share if you wanted a ride at 6 to 7 pm taking that as an example that's that's two sided there's supply side there's demand side supply side is your drivers demand side is us customers asking for a ride if you wanted a ride at 6 pm guess what you would do you would actually go online around 5:45 5:50 something like that that marketplace is truly an on demand on demand but also near real time marketplace meaning the balance of the matching of supply and demand happens within minutes right mm. so when at that time at the time when you get an influx of rides you actually know uh you actually know like how many rides there are because these customers all these consumers already want that right and either you have the supply or you don't have the supply you have the number amount of drivers or you don't have that and let's say that you know i'm i'm making i'll make up a exaggerated example you got a million requests for some reason suddenly there was an earthquake something some you know some event happened 
there were a million ride requests and you only have a thousand drivers right now you can only you can only give rides to a thousand people the other people will not be able to get rides i mean you can even do shared rides and stuff like that but it only gets you so far right like ultimately the other people won't be able to. in our case that problem becomes extremely amplified so in our case what happens in a delivery case you when the delivery happens at six to seven the shopping of that order will happen probably right before that right so it will happen mm -hmm. around five o'clock you know the shopper the gig worker who is actually delivering that order we would we need to offer that we call it offering we need to offer that order out in the gig worker app there's a separate app there's a consumer app there's a gig, gig app similar to lyft and uber and all these other you know there's a customer app there's a supply app demand app right so uh so we will offer that order or make that order available maybe around four o'clock five o'clock right depending on what's in the order again right like this is mm -hmm. if it is perishable if it is not perishable like there's all these if it is if it is an electronic item for example electronics like i said it's a different use case right because mm. you can shop and deliver electronics in the morning and that's fine and you, it can stay on your you know front door for like for days for example as long as you know there's also retail theft and things like that so we have to think of mm. that also and all of these are real problems we think about but i mean when for groceries you would typically give the order a couple of hours ahead the shopper would actually go right they or the gig worker would actually pick whoever picks it up they'd go they pick up the order and they go and deliver between 6 to 7 in our example so far so good now the challenge is when you are placing the order at noon and the order needs to go at 5 we have to basically be able to uh, as with as much confidence as possible our job is as as because we are the marketplace who kind of manages deliveries our job is to make sure when you get the order between 6 to 7 pm you get everything that you that you requested for and not like part of it right so you know you re requested 10 items you requested milk you re requested eggs and so on our job is ideally our job is that your experience delivery experience should be basically contactless right which is you just mm -hmm. place the order you know like amazon you place the order you do, you don't you don't fiddle with anything else the box just comes mm -hmm. you open the box you're you're good you're happy so the yep. the ideal experience is that but at 12 pm and 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 us as as a marketplace we actually don't we we have a lot of retailers on our platform we have uh, you know, in some places we have Costco, we have, uh, you know, like Safeway, we have this, we have that, like all the local retailers, right? Where local grocery stores, we have all those retailers. Now the challenge is we don't control the inventory for those retailers. We don't know when those aisles are restocked mm -hmm. for those retailers. At 12 p.m. when you are placing the order, we need to have high confidence as to what will be available for the retailer you are choosing, what items will be in stock, what items will not be in stock. At 5 p.m. when when we actually give it to the gig worker who actually goes and uh, shops the order. If we make that prediction wrong, if we don't get it right, then you don't get your full order. If you don't get your full order delivered because some items are missing because they weren't available in the store, then you won't come and place another order with us because you know what? The, there was the one thing in the 10 items that you, this happens all the time, by the way. I wanted the one thing and you gave me the other nine things and the one thing that I wanted, I didn't get. And I, you have a minimum basket size, you know, for free deliveries. I made a minimum basket size. I ordered all these other redundant items because I wanted that one thing. The one thing wasn't delivered, blah, 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 right? Like all of these things happen and you have to deal with your customer support team has to deal with all these things because then people call in and so on and so forth. So a long, long way of saying, and I'll, and I'll get into, you know, the, the, the economical 101, economics 101 of how marketplaces work. So, uh, if you think about, let's, there are many levers that you can use to, uh, influence supply and demand in a marketplace. Let me let me give you a little more in a little more depth. <clears throat> there are many ways in which you can influence supply and demand. One of the obvious ways in which all the all of us as consumers are very highly motivated is price. So yeah. think about just in your minds, visualize that you know you have a a simple graph, right? The graph is your y-axis is quantity, and your x-axis is price. And so you know it starts at zero, zero quantity, zero price. As you go to the right, the price increases. The price is increasing, going up. And as you go up, the quantity is increasing. Now imagine what happens, right? What happens to the, so if you now start plotting demand, number of orders that are coming into the system, when the price is zero, your quantity is infinite because everybody wants mm -hmm. to order something for free, right? So the quantity is infinite. When your price becomes infinite, your quantity becomes, your, your demand becomes zero, mm -hmm. right? The quantity of demand becomes zero because nobody wants to order, can't even afford like something which is infinitely expensive. So. So it goes, basically it slopes down. Supply is the opposite. When the price is zero, nobody wants to work for you for free. 
but when the mm-hmm. price keeps going up the quantity the number of people who want to come and work for you because you are a very attractive employer it goes the opposite so somewhere in the middle there is actually a cut point right where the where these guys intersect where these lines intersect and that point is actually called the equilibrium point in a marketplace and mm-hmm. the equilibrium point price is one variable there can be other variables as well but the equilibrium point is where your supply and demand are exactly balanced you have mm-hmm. the right number of orders coming in you have the right number of people uh you know available to shop this these orders as well and and this is where concept of variable pricing or dynamic pricing comes into picture you can change that point by changing pricing because if you increase the prices demand goes down supply goes up right if you decrease prices mm-hmm. the reverse happens so you can kind of as a marketplace you can control that point using price is one of the levers like i said there may be others but but using that another lever for example is availability what time of the day is your service available if it's available at midnight versus it's available during peak hours during that you can control that right who is available yeah. who is, you know what i mean so there are m- many many things like that which a marketplace can control when can deliveries be available if it is available in the middle of the night then you're not going to get a lot of demand uh, probably not even a lot of supply right like you know like things like that so that's two sided the the thing with three sided is on top of these two you also have inventory which is as as your price goes up your inventory uh, you know inventory is a little weird because at very low prices you don't have any inventory because nobody wants to manufacture anything for free at very high mm-hmm. prices also there is not enough like you know think of picassos right they are very expensive but how many picassos do you have in the world right this very expensive inventory but you don't have that so it's kind of a weird thing so now what you're trying to do is you're trying to do this balancing with a third variable which is the amount of inventory in the system without actually being able to control that inventory Yep. you don't have direct control on it because retailers are controlling it you don't have direct say into you know what happens you are at the mercy of the system of when the inventory is ref- re- is is uh, you know refreshed in the aisles it they could do it they could do it at multiple times in a day right 2 hour, 2 pm 4 pm 6 pm if you send a shopper or if you show when you when the customer is placing the order at that point if you show the customer uh the window that you show the customer is let's say that you know one of the stock these stockings happens at 4 pm and it happens every 4 hours 4 pm 8 pm i'm making this up right if you show the customer a window between 3 to 4 pm and the restocking happens, happens at 4 their order is likely to not get fulfilled completely because the aisles are the most empty at that point right but then the customer wants it at 3 to 4 pm if you don't show them they won't come back to you they'll go to somebody else because somebody else is showing them that giving them that option so that's what makes it complicated long story short you asked me shrinath like what is the what are the complexities in a two sided because it's sort of in real time near real time either you do it or you don't right but in this in in a three sided you actually have to it's the way i think i i try to explain to people it's a combination of amazon and and lift or amazon and uber the demand side looks like amazon the app looks like amazon you go you place an order right like like a retail app but the fulfillment side looks like a ride share marketplace for example uh, you know to use those two big uh examples so that that amalgamation that combination of these two different sites makes it extremely challenging to solve problems in library and so on so i i hope that you know that wasn't too technical for the audience no no so you are basically saying there's like supply demand you know which you have to manage and there's also inventory which you have to manage and the inventory changes by the uh, you know the retailer which maintains it and it's seasonal and there's like a lot of just variables and it gets more and more complex right yeah correct I so, I actually faced the exact same problem that you mentioned as well, Vishal. So I ordered from Instacart. I I think ordered from one of the Indian grocery stores. I told, yeah. hey, I want uh, six brinjals, the small ones. I mean, you you usually look at the image and say, hey, this is the small one that you want to get. And that person got like six big, <laughs> big brinjals. I'm like, dude, what do I do with this now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it's a pretty complex uh, i mean use case right balancing the multiple users here retailers the users and uh, the people who deliver right so you are trying to optimize for everyone so that's a uh, pretty complex right and some of the stuff are not in your control like you mentioned the inventory which is all retailers yeah i was just and, and i would only assume if there were other marketplaces right where you know you have more sides to it like one of the other sides which is fairly common is it's a little bit it's a little bit not really real time but you know cpg or advertisers right that's like the fourth side then some people call that as a four sided marketplace because your advertisers are a fourth persona who may not be a retailer who may be something else right for example so besides your 
so the three sides in our case the three sides are i should have said this before in our case the three sides are your customer is one side the store is the second side obviously the third is the gig workers but then the fourth side uh, you know the fourth side could be like an advertiser who's coming in advertisers are a little bit they are a little bit removed but uh, but these three sides are the ones where and a transaction has to hit these three sides and advertiser is sort of you know in the middle of the transaction as well so it becomes more and more and more complex because advertisers might also have limited inventory limited budget now you yep. may want to manage that i mean it may be virtual inventory i mean we think of ads as infinitely ads are infinitely available but the budget is limited how many ads do you show so you know doing all of this it becomes more and more nuanced and complex when you have more and more players so when you're optimizing uh, like what are you opt- optimizing for in this marketplaces is it like more like revenue or is it the price or is it more the you know the payout for the gig worker like yeah yeah it's a great question right it's actually all of the above if you think about oh, it okay. right right because if you think about it what is the motivator for it's like everybody and that is the that is the i think the beauty of running a free market marketplace company or just a free market company every player in in a free market participates because there is something for them to gain right uh, okay. why would they come to a marketplace if they don't have something that they want so you know we we talked about this you know in the the economics 101 that we discussed uh why would a gig worker come to a marketplace because they want to really make as much money as possible obviously mm-hmm. and why shouldn't they right it's an economic opportunity why would a customer come to a marketplace marketplace x versus y because they get bottom dollar they are they are get, getting as cheap as a price as possible they do what does a business want out of all of this business wants to run a sustainable business so that we can grow demand right like it it's like you know if we charge too much money or too much we have too 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 high margins and we don't have a strong grip, like if the market if the space is very commoditized meaning there are many competitors for example right it's it's not for whatever reason right it's you know historically etc there are many competitors then you don't have pricing power if you had if you are a little bit more if you had more uh and i want to use this word carefully if you had a little bit more influence or market share meaning like if you had a little bit more monopoly right you know on one part of the, it, it could be any part of the marketplace by the way if you are the one who covers all retailers and nobody else does then you win if you cover right. all the gig workers because for whatever reason they are only coming and working for you then you win because other marketplaces cannot you know sustain that demand if you are getting all the demand and nobody else is shopping anywhere else then also you win right so like there are various ways of winning uh, but ultimately uh, everybody who's participating is ultimately looking for what they can gain out of the marketplace so yeah. it's always it is or that is the that is the beauty and challenge of that's the that the balancing act that we have to run is that how do we create a sustainable business where we have to obviously uh, you know extract something out of every transaction we have a margin you that's what you know we call as or, or commonly you, you hear as unit economics what is our unit economics we have a margin we need to extract some value so we can run a company because there are people you know software systems people uh, that need that we need to actually run run this company and make this service available but then you know our gig workers want to come and work for us because they are getting paid better or they are getting more payouts more than you know our competitors if we were not paying them anything why would they bother coming and working for us they would just go and do something else. you know they value their time so it's like it's a combination of all those things yeah, yeah marketplace yeah. is complex so and also right like a lot of times when i uh, see marketplaces right always wonder right how how you know what's the process of getting your like the first 100 people sign up as gig workers or you know customers or retailers like do you know like can you walk us through the process or how did ship do that like what were the initial stages where they were getting these customers and how did they find my mar- product market fit uh it's a good question i think i think ultimately the golden rule is golden rule for not just marketplaces but generally any product uh is that where there is demand supply will follow like demand is king customers are king you can go and have partnerships in i'll give my myself our ship as an example then i can use maybe facebook or something else right like let's talk about that so you can for example uh uh partner with all the retailers that exist in the us ship is only a north america company by the way so you know you can partner with everybody every every store in the us but if nobody is actually placing any orders like you know you're That's building right. technology for nothing you can have every gig worker that works in the us on anything you can have them available on your platform but if they are not getting anything to do 
they you know they are not going to there is nothing happening so transactions only happen with your gmv with your top line top line sales which is basically demand so demand is always king and i'll give you a classic example of this is all eyeballs businesses right as the the way i like to ca- characterize this is there are eyeballs businesses at least this is my very simplistic view of the world there are these eyeballs businesses and there are these transaction businesses transaction businesses are your marketplace and your platforms right things like you know stripe fintech business a per transaction they are like we will take some 2% whatever right whatever their 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 fees is their margin is and you know it's just like on volume they basically just have that's their gmv per transaction so they are also in the business of unit economics the eyeballs business is and you know shipped is obviously that amazon is that per transaction they're making you know they're making some money uh the eyeballs businesses are uh things like facebook right let's just get eyeballs and we'll figure out what to do once we have that much demand we'll basically figure out how to monetize the demand link instagram facebook and things like that so there are two fun- fundamental businesses but even for that business which is eyeballs business you do need a lot of demand like everything starts with demand ultimately so uh yeah so i think that's sort of like the initial answer to your question like how do you how do you you know how do you sort of where do you focus on given that there are so many players uh, said you have to focus on demand you have to kind of start with demand you have to make sure that if the demand perishes if the demand ceases to exist the rest of the marketplace will definitely collapse it becomes a huge problem when demand when you're losing market share on the demand side on the on the other side if you if you have a huge if you have a healthy market share on the demand side other people will follow supply will follow inventory will follow in in our case but demand is sort of the key that's where you create the demand it, loop first and then the rest all uh, two sides of the marketplace follow with that yeah sense yeah it it but it sounds natural and obvious as well right so i think your other question was how did how did ship do it initially it was basically that how did we find product market fit it was basically that we made a service available so ship was founded in alabama and birmingham and the way it worked was they made the service available uh in a part of the country in in us where it wasn't uh they found users where it was like any other experiment you know we, we all of us are pms here right so you know you try an idea either it works or it's that's why it's called a venture you know you venture yeah. and either that venture works or or it doesn't in this case in that place and time uh it felt like people were people found a lot of use for this especially you know people who have kids who are busy who you know or or even people who for example may think that the grocery delivery is a chore right there are people like that right like uh, there are a lot of people who for example have full time drivers because they don't want to drive themselves right because they think driving is a chore they might as well sit in a car and you know do something else for example use their time doing something else so things like that or that that's the reason why a lot of people have uber and lyft partly because they don't have they don't want to uh, have the hassle of owning a vehicle but also they like being driven around because they can work in a car for example but if they were driving they could so things like that you know so in in that mm-hmm. place and time they basically found the, the founder found product market fit uh, it was founded in 2015 so it's almost it's been almost 10 years uh, since the founding and the shift is owned by it was acquired by uh one of the biggest uh, retailers in north america called target.com so if your audience has heard of target uh that was one of the biggest retailers and uh that was a, it was acquired in 2018 but target has actually run us operated us as a independent company uh completely independently so we run our we have a different ceo which is different from the ceo of target so you know we are run as a completely independent company uh we are obviously accountable to target so one of the ways of thinking is that we are sort of the incubation arm or the you know one of the ways of that is we of course do our own things as well uh you know because we uh we 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 get some part of some part of this right which target did not have as a as a feature on their platform so they use us now they say that delivery powered by ship for example when you check out on target especially online uh you know deliveries are powered by ship and things like that so again product market fit the founder tried the idea there was a particular segment of users you know busy busy families busy moms people who feel like grocery delivery is a chore right uh, or or doing groceries is a chore like you know a couple of hours in their day in their week for example you know don't don't enjoy it that much they basically started using it it scaled there were more and more people like that it scaled uh, it felt like you know there was product market fit there and then it kind of grew from there i have a question on top of that so as product managers right one of the biggest things that we do is prioritization and in order so, for us to do that we define the core metrics that we want to drive for that specific quarter um two way marketplace itself is tough three way marketplace is like exceptionally harder 
so how do you go about defining that and how do you work with your product managers in defining it yeah i think we are <clears throat> i think what you are i think this is sort of in the area of how do you set goals and what are your okrs if we were to make it very concrete right like what do you prioritize what are the metrics that are most important what are the metrics which are not what you should focus on what you should uh, there's there's no one size fits all answer to this even at a single company i i, I will say that there is always there are always two uh there are always two metrics which are sort of critical to a company's existence they are existential to a company one of them mm-hmm. is at some point or they at some point they become existential one of them is the first one we talked about is number of customers and number of transactions that are happening on your platform if that doesn't happen nothing happens so that so it may be that you know uh, it may be that you know you had a transaction goal as a as a company you had some transaction goal or or even for facebook for example you know eyeballs business there was a number of users goal, and they hit a new milestone billion users 2 billion users whatever uh, and they feel like okay we hit that like last last year uh you know in the last quarter we feel like in the next 2 3 quarters we don't have to be that aggressive about growth anymore that's this is the growth pm area right so we don't have to be that aggressive about growth anymore uh we can actually like focus on some other things right so first is uh one of the most critical ones is growth that's why you see growth pms as a specialty uh, as a specialized skill you know uh, as a specialized role in 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 product management as well the second obvious one is as a company and this is sort of uh, this is something that the customers don't don't really care about this they want this number to be zero but when you are a company that is accountable to investors which every company is the investors will hold you accountable or the wall street will hold you accountable for this which is profitability right you cannot run a business without it being sustainable without you know getting something out of the platform so customers hope that you know you make no profit you give them a service of free which is you know the economics 101 we talked about but as a investor or even as a business just to be able to provide that service you have to have you have to have some profit so you can run a sustainable mm-hmm. business so those two i think are sort of your implied goals at some point it might be that you feel like at the scale that we are at we expected certain profitability we hit that profitability we don't have to go after all the we don't have to prioritize all the monetization projects in the next you know 6 months to 1 year for example it's fine it's usually a yo yo between these two right like either you grow or you are profitable sometimes you throw so much money to grow you're just throwing money to acquire users that you lose your unit unit economic suffers because you are throwing money to acquire users and the users you, now you're growing the users but the users are potentially not converting into transactions you know because you acquiring users advertising and all of that also takes money and and it takes time but they're not converting so you know that that part like growing users growing paid users growing actual users paid users growing the number of orders that they are growing the usage of the users uh you know per week usage per month usage like all these are sort of growth goals uh and then once you do that which is again the eyeballs thing right you 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 do that at some point you're like okay now this is too expensive we have we are burning investor money or we are burning some of the cash reserves we have now we need to figure out how to actually monetize it uh so then you know monetization becomes a goal then you feel like no i think you feel like no we have achieved you work with your finance teams and you know your operations partners and things like that in companies that have operations and you're like no we feel like our unit economics is healthy now we are making profit per order right per transaction now with that new baseline let's start growing again let's get more users so it's usually those two metrics are sort of super critical the third one that is uh that is the one that sort of i guess gets the most kicked around and that is sort of and this is one thing that i i would say that was a learning for me uh you know as as i as i matured into the into my role and as i as i started working on more and more, more and more complex problems those two are a little more easy to quantify right like you know growing number of users growing number of transactions growing this that we're talking about okrs here right so you know that's very easy to quantify how many users purchased last year uh, last last week last month last quarter how many users are purchasing this week this month this quarter that's easy are how many times did the users purchase that is a usage question what is the usage and how many mm. times are they doing that's these are like very easily measurable right uh and monetization is also very easy what was the variable what was the profit last time what is the profit here that's also very easy to measure the one that actually is the most elusive which i think is the third one is basically product quality or product market fit so when you grow 
And when you have a lot of different people with different expectations coming into your marketplace, at that point, now they may have different expectations. Now you have lost your product market fit, right? Because now these users want something else from your, from your marketplace. And if you're not able to give it to them, uh, you know, they'll probably just churn. So you're burning money, but you're not able to retain. So retention, we talk about retention and engagement and retention. So that is sort of the, the so retention engagement as well as quality, I would say, like your NPS scores, your, mm. you know, uh, you know, feedback and things like that. So again, we are talking about metrics. What do you prioritize? So again, what I said is those two, the growth and the uh, profitability, profitability metrics, unit economics metrics are generally top down. Like the company is like, we need this. If we don't grow, we are going to die. If we are not profitable, we're going to die. Like, you know, we need to do something because we are in court. We are in a, in a red zone right now. We need to improve these two fundamental levers of our business. That's very, very simple. But let's say if you have done that beyond that, now the problem is, yeah, you have grown, you have, you have quite a, you know, you have acquired three X, four X, the users, but they are not sticking with the platform. So now the problem mm -hmm. is how do you find that product market fit? How do you, and how do you prioritize that? Right. I think the question that you were asking for me, and that is a challenging question is in between doing all of this, while everybody can, it's easy to quantify growth. It's easy to quantify monetization, right? In between doing all of this, if you, we, we at ship, for example, have a customer support team, they may come back and say that the feedback that we are getting mm -hmm. is, is, is not good. So, you know, can you do something about the feedback? Well, the team is now focused on just getting more and more users and you know, whether, you know, like, because you know, your heads down, yeah. just solving growth problems and growth experiments. Like what about the feel like we never even, because feedback also comes a little after the fact, right? They used it, you know, a month later you start first year. Like, this is just like, you know, people don't know that we just released some features, you know, mm. this is all like people just, uh, it's not like, it's not baked feedback, right? But after a month, mm. month and a half, two months, you're like, oh, now the feedback we're getting is probably baked feedback. Meaning our users know how, what, what the features are. They know how to use the, use the, use the feature. What are the gaps? Now the feedback that, that we are getting out of this feature, mm. something we need to address. But before that, we were ignoring it because a small percentage of the users were giving us the feedback, but a large percentage were fine with it. So you keep mm. going. You know what I mean? Unless like it's a blocker, it's some blocker, which is like, you know, like there's a bug. People are not able to do something, do a fundamental transaction. In that case, you have to obviously address. It's a quality thing, right? Bug is also a quality thing. If you think about it, you have to yep. address it because it blocks your business. But outside of that, if there are like edge cases, you know, 10% of the people are dissatisfied. Fine. 90% are, are 90 percent are okay. Let's keep going. Uh, we'll come back to the 10% later. And we don't even know if we have confidence that the 10% is, these are the people who are valuable to us, not valuable to us. There's all these questions. My point is prioritizing these type of quality problems and product market fit problems is generally the hardest. Unfortunately, mm. that is something I learned, right? Like we, we talk about things like tech debt, design debt. It's sort of in the same area. If you think about it, right? Uh, what I learned is all these problems at some point are ticking time bombs, right? You mm. either use, you spend some time dedicatedly on your, on your roadmap, uh, to prioritize some of these problems, you know, ask your team, coach your team to actually do prioritize. And, and if they say, that this is something we need to rewrite, or this is something that is fundamentally like, it's very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like a pack of cards. It's not built really well. We need to redo this. You, you allow that space. You allow you, then you, as PMs, you go and you talk to your stakeholders that I believe this, uh, the team believes this, that this is something we need to focus on. It's not going to generate growth. It's not going to generate revenue, but this is something, if we don't do it now, two months later, we are going to see an impact on growth. Like mm -hmm. as an example. So we need to prioritize. So usually those are harder, uh, harder, uh, I would say milestones to prioritize on your roadmap. Usually it's a little mm. more challenging, but as PMs, it is our job to make sure that ultimately we are not serving only 90, 95% of the users. We are, we try our best to serve all of them so that we can keep and retain on. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the challenge uh, that we face. Makes sense. Actually, I have one add on question, Vishal on that. It's very complex, right? Um, when you think about a customer, your customer person, I could go crazy. So if you have one specific product, it's fine. You can easily get that. How do you think about that customer person or, or do you even think about that at all? Yeah, yeah, we always think about that. In fact, I mean, you have to think customer backwards because you can't build a product just for yourself. You are not the ultimate user of the product. The one thing that I tell my PMs is the only product that is useful ultimately is something that makes an impact ultimately on the end customer of the product. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it makes a, it, it doesn't even really matter. If the end customer of the product is a business, then that matters, right? Because monetization is 
usually you know it's a business goal because you are trying to sustain the sustain the business sustain the company and it it should make an impact on the business bottom line of or top line of the business that then mm-hmm. it's fine uh, you again between business and customers you would have to prioritize who you are who you are actually like what is critical right now so if you think about it right like let's just break that down for a second right if you think you know how would you just use monetization as an example what would make our gig workers most happy when we pay them more and more and more and more and more as much as we can pay them we should just keep paying them more and more and more right obviously it would make them happier mm-hmm. if we pay them more they would be more happy what would make our customers happy we should charge them lesser and lesser and lesser and lesser uh what would make our business healthy ultimately right uh it is something that we have to operate within us at a certain margin given our mm-hmm. competition given where our market share is etc we have to operate at a certain margin so we continue to exist next year two years from now three years five years as a company right we need to make sure that we are getting in enough healthy unit economics so we can keep running the business because if we keep running the business other things can happen later on but right now we need mm-hmm. to make sure that we forecast where our business is going in terms of burn rate cash burn rate and things like that right opex capex like you know things like that the the cost of operating a business so my point is even between these three users we have to prioritize monetization is one persona which is the supply side has a very different north star for monetization which is exactly opposite of the demand side the business mm-hmm. is something which is like i am in the middle now what do i do like what can we do that's the third persona if you think about it. so it's mm-hmm. like it's balancing between these three and and trying to pick up you know what is the right persona to uh, influence what is the right metric to influence for that persona what is the right metric and who do we who are we right now solving the problem for uh, and by the way you know funny to to again answer this tomorrow if we heard complaints from our demand side which is you know you guys are too expensive versus the competition and they are not coming and ordering with us then i then guess what business business is low priority because we have to figure something out we have to ultimately demand is king so we have to figure that out we have to figure out how mm. we can sustain that kind of go so makes sense hope you guys are enjoying our conversation with vishal on three way marketplace we have also recorded uh, another podcast on experimentation which will be coming out next saturday so please stay tuned